Good morning and welcome to Parkview Christian. We ask that you join us in worship this morning in edifying and glorifying one another and glorifying God. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and free. For saving my soul, thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich All hail the power of Jesus, name that angels prostrate fall. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Bring forth the royal diadem and crown him Lord of all. Chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransom from the fall. Hail him who saved you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saved you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Let every kindred, every tribe on this terrestrial ball To Him all majesty ascribe and crown Him Lord of all To Him all majesty ascribe and crown Him Lord Got him on my knees again. Got him begging, please again. I need you. Oh, I need you. Walking down these desert roads, water for my thirsty soul. I need you. Oh, I need you. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Like the sound of a symphony to my ears It's like holy water on my skin Dead men walk enslaved to sin I want to know about being born again I need you, oh I need you So take me to the riverside Take me under, baptize, I need you, oh, I need you. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. It's like the sound of a symphony to my ears. It's like holy water on my skin. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. 
I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Like the sound of a symphony to my ears It's like holy water on my skin Your forgiveness Is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips It's like the sound of a symphony to my ears like holy water on my skin it's like holy water on my skin father we praise you today God, we come before you as sinful, broken people. So in awe and so thankful that you have chosen us to be your children, that you have called us to be your representatives to the world, to show your love to them. God, we sing of your faithfulness. We sing of your righteousness. We sing of your, your grace and your mercy today. May everything that we do be in honor and praise to you and your holiness, God. We bow before you. We come before you now in humility and just in awe of who you are today, God. We love you so much, Jesus. We pray this in your holy name. Amen. And your love Reaches to the heavens, your faithfulness stretches to the sky, your righteousness is like a mighty mountain. Your justice flows like the ocean's tide, and I will lift my voice to worship you, my King, and I will find my strength in the shadow of your Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness stretches to the sky. Your righteousness is like the mighty mountain your justice flows like the ocean's tides and i will lift my voice to worship you my king And I will find my strength in the shadow of your wings. Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heavens. Your faithfulness. 
stretches to the sky. This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you. All I have within me, I give you praise. And all that I adore is in you. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul, I live for you alone, every breath that I take, every moment I'm away, Lord have your way in me. Let's pray this prayer. This is my desire to honor you, Lord, with all my heart, I worship you, and all I have within me, I give. All that I adore is in you. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm away. Lord, have your way in me. Lord, I give you my heart. I give you my soul. I live for you alone. Every breath that I take, every moment I'm away. Lord, have your way. Lord, I give you my heart, I give you my soul, I live for you alone. You may be seated. As we prepare for communion, um, I'd like to share this thought with you. In the Old Testament, we received the law, and they followed the law, but they had to make sacrifices once a year to move their sins, forgiveness of their sins, to move them to the next year and the next year. And that was the system that was set up so that we would understand that we need forgiveness from God. But when Jesus came, and gave his life on the cross, it changed everything. Because no longer did we have to make the annual sacrifice. He did it once and for all. But unfortunately, the Pharisees had centered on what they did outwardly and not what was in their heart. So when Jesus came, especially in the Sermon on the Mount, he taught it's not just what we do on the outside, but it's what we do in our heart. It, it's a heart thing. And I've really been thinking about that a lot lately, about how we commune with God 
We don't come here and just say, okay, this week, what have I done? What have I not done? Have I committed any sins? But rather, we also should be thinking in addition to that, what's the condition of my heart with Jesus? What have my thoughts been? What have my uh, desires been? Are those in tune with, with what God wants? In Hebrews chapter 10, the first part of the chapter is explaining that, that Christ's sacrifice is once for all. And then when we get to Hebrews 10, chapter 19, it says, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance, with faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. So as we commune today, I would encourage each of us to look at where our heart is. Not just what we do, not just what we say, but if our heart is truly given to Jesus. And if it affects everything that we do, we say, we think. He gave us this time to draw close to him and to draw close to him with a clean and pure heart because of what Jesus did on the cross, which is exactly what we celebrate during communion. Let us pray. Our Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the encouragement it gives us to be together and to celebrate and to worship you and to commune with you and commune with each other and to hear your word proclaimed. God, help us to examine our heart, hearts. Help us to think about more than just what we say or do and maybe what other people think of us, but to think about what's really in our heart and soul and mind and whether you're in control of that. We just sang, we give you our heart and our soul. We turn it over to you, God. Help us to truly do that today as we commune with you. In Jesus' name, amen.
Okay, we're going to move into our uh, prayer time together. If the kids, um, kindergarten through fifth grade, would like to exit now for junior church, Mr. Mike and Miss Vicky's in the back, ready for you. Uh, I first would like to uh, welcome uh, Lynn, who's home with us today. Make sure you see her. She, as you know, uh, we uh, we sponsor her in Africa. And uh, she has a table outside, out in the foyer, and she'll be there after service. So if you'd like to visit with her, she may be here next week, we're not sure, but for sure today. So this is your chance to get to visit with Lynn. Um, we talked about different options for her to share because she usually shares, but given that we're live now, it makes it a little bit hard when you're working in a, in a foreign country that um, is not always open. So be sure and see her uh, after we uh, dismiss service. She'll be outside. Also, uh, Remington and Jesse are home from Spain. Uh, they went on a campus house trip, and uh, so we're. <clears throat> they said they had a wonderful trip, and uh, so our church assisted them in that, and we're glad that they were able to go uh, with the campus house group uh, on the trip. So, what other prayer requests or praises would you like to bring forward? We have mics so that if you. Uh, Speak if you'd please wait till a mic gets you gets to you so that those people watching online could hear you Anybody We have a friend named Daniel Van Zant. He had surgery last Tuesday They removed a tumor probably about the size of a volleyball from his abdomen tomorrow. He's having Surgery to reconstruct the muscles in his belly. So if you guys could pray for him and the nice thing about that is he's very, very close to Connor, our son Connor. And um, Connor living in Delaware. Uh, Daniel is at Bethesda Hospital because he's in the military. And so Connor gets to go visit him about once every week or two weeks. They're about two hours apart. So that's a blessing. Yes. Uh, my... Uh, my uh, my father received news a couple of weeks ago that he uh, they uh, he had shoulder surgery a couple of weeks ago and there was a mistake that was made and so he's going to have to go back into surgery to have his ulnar nerve repaired because it was nicked during surgery so uh, just need help with the doctors to make sure something else doesn't happen and that he'll be able to recover properly. Okay. Yes, we'll pray for that. Also, Sue Powell will be having a, a test uh, this week on Tuesday, and um, so she's been waiting for this test for a long time, so we're happy that they finally moved it up. It was supposed to be in August, but they moved it up to this week. So she's, uh, I'm sure she's probably watching online because when you're getting ready to go in surgery, you're supposed to stay away from people so that you test negative for COVID. So, uh, Sue, we're thinking about you. Anybody else? Way in the back. Kathy, I hope you're going to give us an update on uh, your great granddaughter. The grandbaby, yes. yes. Montana and Dylan got to give her her first bath last night. Oh, good. She did not like it, but they got to give it to her. They've got all the IVs out. So they're hoping it won't be too much longer, but keep them in your prayers. Yes, uh, Montana it had, was able to go home, uh, but the baby's still in the hospital, so uh, uh, hopefully the baby will get to go home soon. And it's Lila, right? The baby's name is Lila. Okay. Just to give you an update, my mom's doing better. My uncle passed away on Wednesday, so just keep the family in prayers. Thank okay, you. thank you, Terry. Anyone else? Okay, let's pray. Uh, dear Lord, thank you uh, for the opportunity to approach your throne, uh, the opportunity to share um, our blessings and our uh, weaknesses and our needs to you as a group, as a body. Father, I pray for all of the requests that have been mentioned, and Lord, I pray for the unspoken requests that each of us have, uh, you know those. Um, we thank you as the creator that you uh, would love us enough to, to listen and, and to watch over us and to care for us. And 
to even send your son to die for us so that we might be with you again. Thank you for this body. Thank you for uh, the opportunities to serve together here. Um, I pray your blessing on Kyler as he shares your word with us today and that we will go from here ready to love and encourage the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Hi, good morning. Good morning, everybody. How's everybody doing? Doing okay? Before we open the word this morning, um, my name's Kyler. I think I know most of you. I'm related to a few people that have been up front this morning. Maybe. Um, if everybody could, with me, it's going to be an interactive morning. That's kind of who I am. Um, you can stand up, greet somebody next to you, do whatever you want. A handshake, a fist bump. If you really want to greet everybody with a kiss, like Paul says, you're more than welcome to. Um, but just, just um, yeah, greet somebody. We're a church. We worship together. We, we look at the word together, but we're also a community. So deep breath. Ah, here we are. Me? I'll, I'll get him back. It's fine. Come on, look at that. Isn't that fun? Isn't that good? That's right. We're supposed to do that. We're called to love each other. We're called to, to do these things. So um, even in the middle of a service, right? It's no problem. So, man, we're having a good time this morning. Like I said, uh, it's going to be interactive. So make sure your arms, if your arms work, I like that. Oh, thank you. Some of you, your arms work. Awesome. First question is Jesus worthy of praise and worship? Some people, yeah. I like it, honey. See, we're on the same page here. Let me ask you again. Is Jesus worth it? Yes. yes. Jesus is worth all of our glory, all of the honor, all the praise. Our whole life laid down for him. If you answered like this, yeah, he's worthy. Actions might not match what you feel. Um, so he's worthy of it all. He's worthy of it all. He's worthy of it all. You guys have heard um, what we're going to talk about today. So as I open the word, let me pray. Thank you, Jesus, for your life, your death, and your resurrection. Thank you that you left and gave us the help or Holy Spirit to, to live in us, live through us, and, and work in and around us. So even though you're omnipresent, we just invite you in this place as we open your word today. God, we ask that you'd, you'd cut us where it hurts. Uh, you'd encourage us and build us up where it hurts. Where it, um, needs to be built up, but we pray, God, that your will be done, and that your word, and that your spirit would be living and active in this place this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So I would like some feedback today. You guys have heard, um, they gave away the preview last week. We're going to be talking about Moses. Um, you ever heard of that guy? No. Moses. No, haven't? Okay, today's going to be your day. Um, Moses. When you think of Moses, do you think Genesis, or do you think Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy? The Torah, how many think Deuteronomy and Leviticus is where the fun of life of Moses was, right? So we're going from uh, Exodus to the end of the Torah. It's going to be a while. If you need, that's why I wanted you to stand up. We're going to be here all day. Um, that's a joke. In some parts of the world, there are churches all day. So it's not that far from our brothers and sisters that live across the world that they do start at 8 and end at 8 happens. What comes to your mind when you think of Moses? Raise your hand. You can just yell it out. I like feedback again. Red Sea, Bush, Ten Commandments, the basket. Okay, gotcha. Sacrifices. He taught about that, right? It's not the fun part that we read about. Ten Commandments, yeah. So we, we've got it. I also need some more response today. I'm going to do something a little bit different. Um, I know when I'm sitting in the pew, sometimes there's a scripture I've read for my whole life or something that the pastor says, and it's like, man, that really spoke to me. You ever had that before? 
just really get you? If that happens today, could you do something to let me know? That'd be okay. Wait, raise your hand or wave your... And I just want to bless you in Jesus' name that whatever happens, whatever God's speaking to you, that He would just continue to grow you. So, most of us think Exodus, right? The fun book of adventure and death and plagues, right? And adventure and breakthrough and healing and parting the Red Sea, whatever. We, we think about the triumphal end of Exodus, right? Most of us. Because that's the end of the story and we know it. Um, as we're talking about these next few weeks, uh, sometimes in the middle it's not the same as it feels like at the end. Um, might feel great, Exodus, last few chapters when they've got out of Pharaoh's control. But we're going to go back a little bit. We're going to go through the life of Moses kind of at a super high level, 30,000 foot view. But I got a, a point that's going to come out of that. So come with me. We're going to be flipping through Exodus. Um, Exodus 1. Here we go. Man, I won't be reading the verses, so if you did your homework like someone told you last week, you might recognize them. But um, Joseph died, right? We talked about Joseph last week. All his brothers, right? He saved them. They all came to Egypt. That's where we start in Exodus. Seventy people of the life and the family of Joseph came to Egypt, right? Joseph was, ended his life well in Egypt. He was put in charge of things and, and had authority and power, and the Pharaoh loved him. What happens in the first part of Exodus? A new Pharaoh came to town, right? The Israelites, the, the people of God were growing, were um, multiplying, were, were doing well for themselves, and Pharaoh wasn't comfortable with that. So what did he do? You know, let's take care of that problem. Let's take care of that problem. Let's just kill these babies when they're born. Um, yeah, a lot going on with that right now. Let's just take care of this. It's easy. We'll just cut them down from the knees and I'll be in power and I won't have to worry about these Israelites who are doing well for themselves, right? So that's, that's where Moses started. We know, we know this story. He was born as a Jewish family um, under the decree to kill all the boys. So he had this miraculous life at his beginning. His mom carried him, birthed him. You know, the midwives didn't do what they were supposed to do. They, they kept him alive. She hid him for three months. If you're following along, we're still in, in chapter 1 and 2 here in, in Exodus. Hid him for three months. Think about three months with your baby. Bonding, a lot of time together, sleepless nights, nursing, right? A, a special time for all of you that have been mothers. Like, those are special times. Then what? Put him in the river. You could say abandoned him, orphaned him, right? Her best choice. She didn't know what to do. She wanted him to live and sent him down the river. Pharaoh's daughter broke the law, knew it was a Hebrew baby, should have been killed. She, another just piece that God was doing, she picked him out of the river. <laughs> Moses' sister was there said, hey, do you need somebody to nurse this baby? She said, yeah, go get a Hebrew woman. Let's do this. She went and got his mom. Abandoned this child, went down the river, and here comes baby Moses back to her to nurse and to grow. And she carried him again. So think about, just think about it as his mom was processing all this, right? Connection, loss, connection again. And then after he was weaned, what happened? Then he grew up in the house of Pharaoh as Pharaoh's daughter's son. Think about that. Have you ever thought about it from his mom's perspective? What a tough life. Slaves, killing your son connection, abandonment. Moses could have been labeled an orphan. Man, we forget about those things, right? Sometimes. Uh, fast forward to chapter two. He's grown. He was fully knew that he was a Hebrew, right? So this whole life, he was 40 years old. 40 years, he said, I'm part of these people that are being oppressed. I'm part of these people that are being enslaved. What do you think his 40 years was like? I'm not even 40 yet. That seems like a long time to, to walk through that tension of saying, my people are being killed. My people are being worked to death, right? That's what I said. We jump to the conclusion of Exodus and we sometimes forget 40 years of tension, of pain, of hurt. Oh, man. But we see the heart of Moses here in chapter 2. He saw an injustice and what did he do? He wanted to serve justice. He killed this Egyptian and buried him. 
Ha ha ha, 40 years old, growing up in the house of Pharaoh, belonged to the people that were enslaved. Moses the murderer. Eee. Sounds different. See, I'm telling you, it's a quick view of Moses. Pharaoh chased him. He left. He was in the wilderness. Can you say trauma? Trauma from a life like that? I don't know what else he went through, but he probably had friendships that had difficulty. That's normal in life. Probably lost people that he was close to, especially as just his life was, was traumatizing, right? Could have been very difficult. Probably things that a lot of us haven't even lived. Well, I know we haven't. Slavery, enslavement, being abandoned. Many of us haven't lived that life. Who's had something traumatic happen in their life? Most of us. We have. First point. That's not the end. Trauma doesn't disqualify us from continuing to walk with God. It might have been something we've done, we've caused. It might have been something that happened to us. That doesn't stop you from being used by God. But it has to be dealt with on a heart level, on a a spirit level with God. You're not disqualified from your past or your trauma. Moses wasn't. 40 years. If you feel that way and say, man, I've done this, so this happened to me that I can't be used by God. Maybe today's your day to repent, turn the other way, and move forward with your life. God's got so much more for each one of you in this room. Okay, here we go. Read the verse. Chapter 2, 23. During those many days, the king of Egypt died. How many days? Many days. Difficult time, difficult life. He was running away, and then Pharaoh died. He was still in the wilderness, right? I I propose to you that that was probably a longer season than half of a sentence in Exodus that Moses was living through. Think about just tension again. That was his life. That was what he knew. But I'll keep, I'll keep reading here. During those many days, the king of Egypt died, and the people of Israel groaned because of their slavery and cried out for help. The city for rescue from slavery came up to God. Their cry, I'm sorry, not city. Their cry for rescue from slavery came up to God, and God heard their groaning, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God saw the people of Israel, and God knew. Hmm. God knew. God knew all the way from the beginning God's outside of time. A lot of times we know this. We're like, man, God's surely hearing my prayers, but if we don't see it happen, well, maybe he's not. (laughs) Have we talked ourselves out of that before? I probably have. Sometimes we have. God knew. Just hold on to that promise today. God heard their cry and God knew. They were still enslaved, but God already knew. God had a plan. It was a long season for the Israelites before they were freed, even from this verse. But God knew. God knew and God knows where you're at today. He knows. He knows. All right, here we go. Chapter 3, the burning bush. When we think of Moses, that's one of the first things we think of. Probably, if that's the first one, many of you said it, one of the first things. The burning bush. You know, it doesn't tell us how long, right? Well, it does. We know from chapter 2 to chapter 3. How old was Moses when this happened? This encounter happened. Does anybody know? 80. He was 40 when he killed the Egyptian and left and fled. Now he's 80. Hey, guess what? There's another 40 years. Good math. So 80, 80, 80, 80. 40 years of leaving the house of Pharaoh before he had this encounter with God. Wow. Have many of us waited for something for 40 years? If you have, Kay says no. You haven't. <laughs> You're 31. You've got nine more years. <laughs> no, it, it, it is. We forget that. 40 years of waiting, living in the wilderness, tending to the flock, in the house of Pharaoh to shepherd. Would you feel defeated from that? Probably did. I don't know if he did or not. Just conjecture. I'm not going to guess, but I probably would. Man, did I fail? Did I do something wrong? Is God really the God of my people when I've been here for 40 years? Man, 
We know the story, right? I'll read it, um, 1 through 10. Actually, I'll summarize it. He had this incredible encounter. He saw this bush. But I don't think the main point of this was that the bush burned and was on fire but didn't burn. Verse 3. And Moses said when he saw this, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. So the bush was on fire, not burning. We know the story. But I don't even think that was the main point. The crux of it was Moses said... I will turn aside. I will look to see this thing. That was Moses' response. Point number two. Moses saw this incredible supernatural encounter from God, but but it wasn't the the fire that, that really was where the point was. The point was that he turned to look at it. And then, follow along here, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, when God saw his response to turning to something, then the Lord said, Moses, and he said, here I am. His action is what I want to focus on today. We've seen things of God. You've, you've seen maybe something supernatural, something, a miracle that you've prayed for but didn't quite believe. It happens. But what do we do in that, in that space? Do we focus on those things or do we say, man, God, you're in this. Let me look at you. I want to say that's the point of this burning bush experience. I mean, he left the bush, still wasn't consumed. Great, awesome, doesn't match the laws of nature. But because of that, he turned, and God said, I see you turning, Moses, Moses. That was his call. A major God moment right at the end. So there's this dialogue between Moses and God, and he's like, here's what I have. Here's the promise I have for you. Moses, we see, we know. He said, I don't know about that. Who am I to say? I've been a shepherd. (laughs) He tries to talk himself out of it. Who's done that in their life? You feel something that the Lord's leading you to do, and you say, not me. I don't think I'm good enough. I don't dress well enough, or I can't speak that well. That was Moses's. No, no. Moses' response was he turned to the bush, and that's when God called him. That's the point. That's the point. Man. Okay, I'm going to skip a few chapters. Here we go. I'm telling you, we're flying high. Make sure we catch this. Jump over to chapter 7. The Lord said to Moses, See, I have made you like God to Pharaoh, and your brother Aaron shall be your prophet. And you shall speak all that I command you, and your brother Aaron shall tell Pharaoh to let the people of Israel go out of his land. But I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and though I multiply my signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, Pharaoh will not listen to you. Then I will lay my hand on Egypt and bring my hosts, my people, the children of Israel, out of the land of Egypt by great acts of judgment. The Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand against Egypt and bring out the people of Israel from among them. Moses and Aaron did so, just as the Lord commanded them. God told Moses what was going to happen. He said, I'll bring you out, right? Did you catch that? I'll bring you out. But what happens before they get brought out? Anybody remember? Ten plagues. Wonderful time to live in Egypt. Right? Frogs and locusts and gnats. Hmm, sounds great. Doesn't it? You know, God God told Moses. That's the point that we're going to kind of get into today. Moses' reaction and interaction with God. First, it was something incredible. Moses turned to God. Turn to look. God spoke to him. But then back and forth all through this book, we see Moses pulling away, going to talk to the Lord. The Lord told him what was going to happen. He didn't tell him how. He didn't say, you know, after 10, then you'll get out. So just have patience for 10. No, he didn't tell him all the details, but he told him, I will bring your people out. If you're in the midst of something today, how many times do we forget the promises of God? I don't see it. I don't feel it. It hasn't happened yet. (laughs) Poor me. Moses didn't know everything. And we see that, right? Each plague, the first one, the second one, he'd go back to God and God would say, here's what's going to come. And then he'd go tell the Pharaoh it happened. He'd go back to God. Here's what's going to come. So he, he was back and forth with God. But if it was me, probably by plague three or four, I'd be like, God, remember what you said? Did you forget? He didn't. But Moses had this promise from God that I just read in chapter seven. That was his anchor. I think that's probably what held him when his people were getting still in slavery, not freed. He would remember. I could just see it. Moses going back saying, God, I remember you told me this. We need to do that. 
Who's ever read a promise in the Bible and said, oh, it's so beautiful? Why haven't I seen that? Anybody? Remember, those hands work, right? Yeah, thank you. Some of you. <laughs> I'm glad your hands work. Oh, have you done well with that? Knowing a promise of God and holding on to it? Or have we kind of just let it go? And say, oh, maybe you didn't really tell me that. I don't know. But here we are, 10th plague, it did the trick. Interesting. Remember how Moses was born? They were killing all the firstborns. 10th plague, the justice of God to come back. And that was the thing that set their people free, right? <laughs> Jump to 13, chapter 13 of Exodus, Exodus 13. The Lord tells Moses, consecrate to me all the firstborn. Everything that Moses was born into was flipped upside down. The Lord said, not only will I free you and Pharaoh won't be killing your firstborn, but set the firstborn aside for me. The complete opposite of what was happening in Moses' physical life when he was born. A redemptive God. You see that? Pretty incredible. So here we are. Whoa, they're free. They're leaving Egypt. They're out of slavery. Some of us maybe have struggles that we feel like, I haven't quite been freed from that yet. But you can be free from sin, from something you've struggled with for years and years. There's freedom in Jesus. That's another point. I'm a little, um, not one, two, three points quite today, but kind of fly over. But there's a few nuggets in here that it spoke to me this week. Just something that maybe doesn't matter for this message, but I thought it was pretty cool. Chapter 13, verse 19, they carried Joseph's bones as they went out from Egypt. Why? You guys ever read that? They carried his bones, so like all these millions of people are leaving Egypt. And here's Joseph's bones. Why did they do that? Do you know? Dad, you read it last week. It's actually in Genesis 50, 25. Joseph asked them, he said, when you go out, take my remains with you. Moses, the people of Israel, after all this time, years and years and years, decades, he's 80 when they got freed, he was being obedient to what one of his forefathers said. Interesting point. Interesting point. What I want to say, though, is Joseph, years before, fully believed that his people would step into the promised land. He knew that they'd be freed, and so he said, take me with you. I won't be here in body, but take my bones with you. Interesting. A caravan of... Joseph's bones. That stuck out to me. <laughs> Here we go. Red Sea. See, I'm telling you, we're going fast. The Red Sea. Pretty cool story. Exodus 14. I'll read verse 1 to 4. Then the Lord said to Moses, tell the people of Israel to turn back and encamp in front of this place between Migdal and the sea, in front of Baal Zephon. You shall encamp facing it by the sea. For Pharaoh will say to the people of Israel, they are wandering in the land and wilderness to shut them in. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, the Lord says, and he will pursue them. And I will get glory over Pharaoh and all his host. And the Egyptians shall know that I'm the Lord. What happened? Same thing. God told Moses what was going to happen. He promised, I will get the glory from this. You see that? And then what happened? Here comes the chariots. They look behind them. If you've seen the movies, they look behind them. They're coming down the mountain. All the Israelites say, Moses, you awful leader. Why'd you bring us here to die? But Moses had this promise from God. And he followed what God said, right? This was probably tested. What, what the Lord said to Moses as a leader. Moses would probably, when everybody was grumbling at him, and he would see the Egyptians coming after him. It was probably tested in his heart. Man, I think you said that, God. God, you told me this. Mm, another season, I don't know how long, minutes or days of tension, saying, God, you told me that you'd get the glory for this, but they're also right behind me. They're going to kill us. Right? Tension, tension, tension. But Moses responded with faith and, and full of faith, right? The Lord told him to raise up his staffs, and the people held this Aaron, and they held his staff up, and guess what? The Lord did exactly what he said. He told Moses, Moses walked it out in faith. The Lord fulfilled his promise in verse 31. They might have not done great in the middle from getting the promise to seeing the fulfillment of the promise, especially the Israelites, but man, they, they got it. The Lord did what he said. 
So there they are. They cross the Red Sea. They're out of the land of Egypt. Everything's all dandy. Yes? Straight to the promised land. It's all easy. We did it. Woohoo! No, it didn't quite happen. In, in um, chapter 19, we know when uh, this is where kind of I'll move on from talking about Moses. He got settled on Mount Sinai. What's Moses' response? On the third new moon after the people of Israel had gone out of the land of Egypt, on that day they came into the wilderness of Sinai. They set out from Rephidim and came to the wilderness of Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness. The Israel, their Israel encamped before the mountain, while Moses went up to God. Climbed the mountain, right? We know those experiences. Moses was in this new place. What was his response? I need to go meet with God. When you're in a difficult spot, maybe not just difficult, a new spot, is that our first response? Let me pull away. Let me go and meet with God and hear what he has to say in this season. Sometimes we might. Sometimes we don't. But what I want to point out, I I went really quick through Moses, I know, but Moses had this relationship with God where he would speak to God and God would speak to him. Who else is glad that God still speaks to us? You can raise your hand, right? Oh, man. We see it in in the New Testament, right? The disciples, Jesus, they pull away and go to this side of the the water. or They go to this mountain to pull away to be with God. Do we do that nowadays? Some people love camping. It's a great place to pull away and be with God for a few days. But is is that our point to do it? Or is it we just want to get away from all these people? I don't know. (laughs) <laughs> not trying to step on any toes, but there's things we can do to pull away and be with God that we have to do, that we need to do to get out of maybe the, the season that we feel like we're in. But like we said, aren't we glad God speaks to us? Man, he speaks to us. He tells us what we need when we need it. He might even tell us before we need it, like Moses. But it's our job to hear from God. And those, those times where you just know that the Lord's speaking to you, we like to say in our house, it's, it's those anchors that you put down. And when you're tested, when your boat's being pulled, is your anchor set in the promises of God? One of them, one example we had when we had foster kids, um, two-year-olds, and Jaden was two, triplets that were two, interesting time of busyness. Um, one was given to us and was healthy. The other was called, they called us because they said she'd never eat again. She needed a feeding tube. She had cerebral palsy. She'd never walk or never work or never really do anything. But we both heard the Lord. It felt like different times. You heard first and I was a little bit later that, that this was God inviting us to do this. Now, man, those first 72 or 96 hours when one of the girls didn't stop crying except when she slept like four hours a day, Man, that was my test of saying, is my anchor set in something that's going to move or not? So I want to propose, that's my, my big point of the life of Moses, is that, that he would go and hear from God, and he would walk it out in faith. He would lead his people. Right? We need to do the same thing. It doesn't stop with Moses. It doesn't stop at certain year, the year 1800, 1900. No, it's for us today too. We need to pull away. We need to hear the voice of God. We need to live our life doing the things that he says to us. You know, the, the, the verse that when we read with Moses, it said, he heard God, God spoke to him. Sometimes we say, that sounds pretty nice. He'd come down the mountain shining with light. It's exciting. Think about the pressure. The only one of millions that would hear that. Now, here we are, a hundred and some people that now have that relationship with God through the Holy Spirit, that the veil's torn, that he connects with us directly. How much more should we be living in faith? This verse kind of makes it sound easy because he walks to God and hears from him. What about you? What about me? Has the Lord been speaking to us at all? And have we answered? Hmm. Has God invited you to step into something like one of the spiritual disciplines? And we've just said, now that's uncomfortable. Has God asked us maybe to fast about something or to pull away for a weekend of silence, just communing with God? I don't know. Maybe he has, maybe he hasn't. 
Have we been obedient, seeking counsel of the people of God to live out a life that's pleasing to Him? Maybe, maybe not. When was the last time we went to God and said, God, I need to hear from you. Speak to me. A lot of times our prayers aren't quite like that. They're just telling God our problems or even praising Him for what's good, but there's also a piece of prayer that we just sit and wait in relationship, relate, commune, talk, and listen to what He has to say. Are we even okay with that prayer? To say, God, speak to me. I want to hear you. For some, that's even uncomfortable. So, As I wind up today, I want to go through some of the ways that we see, mostly in the New Testament, how God can speak to us. So that's where we're at. Uh, If it's you today and you say, I don't think I've ever heard from God. John 10. If you're his sheep, you know the shepherd's voice. Mm. Anybody could call a group of sheep. If I go and yell at sheep, you know what? They don't care. If their shepherd calls, one word, they'll come to him. Are you a sheep today? If you're a sheep, you know his voice. John 10, read the whole thing. Hearing God, some people get a little nervous. Hearing God isn't something new or special or new revelation that no one's ever had before. No, not at all. It's God speaking to us because he's a relational God. One way God speaks to us. Okay, here, here's where the hands come in. Has it God ever spoken to you in this way? Through circumstance. Has God ever spoken to you through circumstance? Yep. Sometimes you feel, I think it's God, I'm doing this, and slams the door in your face. Jonah's probably a great example of that. God spoke to him, he didn't do it. God showed him, hey, that was me. We'll go into that in a few weeks. We've all had that. Has God ever spoken to you through his word? Absolutely. All scripture is God-breathed and suitable for teaching and equipping, right? One of the primary ways he speaks. In Proverbs, it talks that God speaks through his people. Who has ever had counsel of a multitude of counselors that you know it was God using them to tell you what you needed to hear? Many of us. There's wisdom in the multitude of counselors, the writer of Proverbs says. Here's another one we're all super comfortable with. Still small voice. 1 Kings 19, was he in the thunder? No. Was he in the earthquake? No. But it's still small voice. You ever felt that? Absolutely. Here's some some other ones that maybe aren't as comforting, comfortable. An impression we have in our heart. In um, Acts 27, we see this a lot in Acts. Um, Paul was on this ship and he said, guys, I have a feeling it's not going to go good. He didn't hear the voice of God, but it was in his heart. You ever had that where you're going somewhere like, I don't think I should go there today. And I don't know why. Yes, that's the Holy Spirit speaking to you. Also, they had a prayer time. They sent out Paul and Barnabas. We talked about it a few weeks ago in our Sunday school class. They were impressed. It was impressed upon their heart to send out these two to go and be missionaries, right? Impressions. That's the Holy Spirit speaking. Acts 2.17 is uh, uh, speaking back to what it says in Joel 2.28. In those days, I'll pour out my spirit on all flesh. And the young men will prophesy and the old men will see visions and have dreams, right? Right? And have you ever had or heard of someone that's had a dream or a vision that the Lord's talked to them, spoke to them? Absolutely. On the mission field, we heard it a lot. Not only on the mission field, also in America, God speaks still. <laughs> Maybe no background of anything of God. And this one thing, while they're sleeping, while our body's asleep, the Spirit of God speaks to us. God speaks through those things. Joseph had one of these encounters. When Mary was already pregnant... And he wasn't quite on board yet, right? Aren't we glad that God speaks in ways that maybe we couldn't get in the way when we're sleeping? (laughs) Uh, Encounters. Think about Saul on the road to Damascus. He saw, it says he saw something and then he was blinded. He fell off the road, right? We know that. An encounter. Going back to the same story in Acts 9, who else is a, a big piece of that story? Ananias? What happened to Ananias? Remember? The Lord spoke to him, say, go to this guy that's killing all these people. How did God speak to him? You remember? Yeah, he had this encounter, this dream. Um, Another one, (laughs) a vision. Peter saw this meat coming down. 
Arise, kill and eat. Who else is glad today that Peter had that visitation and encounter because it, without that, we wouldn't be in the fold, right? God speaks through many of these ways. Another encounter, Paul says in 2 Corinthians, very humble man, I know a man who once 14 years ago was caught up. That's the word Paul uses, caught up in the body or out of the body. I don't know, but something happened and the Lord spoke to me. I would consider that an encounter with God. Nature, who's ever heard God speak to you through nature? A beautiful picture. Somewhere we're at, Paul in Romans writes that, 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 you know, we know God because we see nature. A way that God speaks. Another one, probably the one that maybe the least of us have heard, but maybe you have. The audible voice of God. God can still speak in that way. That's the way he spoke to Moses. Um, That's the way he spoke to the prophets of Old Testament. There's been people I've heard stories. I haven't heard this myself, but they've, they've heard the audible voice of God. God speaks in a multitude of ways. My question for you today is, what's the anchor, the last time that you heard from God? Did we set it in the bedrock well? Or when we were in the midst of hearing the promise and seeing the fulfillment, did we say, maybe I heard wrong, (laughs) talk ourselves back from that ledge? I don't know. Praise team, if you guys want to come up, you can. This week, I want to ask God to speak to me in a way that I could hear what he says and that I would do like Moses and hold on to what he says when it's difficult. We've had a week this week, if you've heard me preach before, I talk about it a lot. This life lived for God, we have a lot of things happening at the same time. We have a cup of joy and a cup of suffering at the same time. We've had things in our life this week that um, friends in China um, had a difficult week. A lot of things, death, cup of suffering, but also at the same time, we're seeing some things in our own personal life that we've been waiting for for months. It's both. It's both. But when God speaks to you in any of the ways, maybe there's ways that I didn't even list today. Are we listening? Or are we uh, trying our best to do it our way? Are you a sheep? Do you know his voice? If you're not a sheep today, today's the day. The water's clean. His grace is here. You know, it's your day. It's your day to come into the flock through the gate called Jesus. Hmm. If Holy Spirit's working on you through this, if you're convicted, if you're encouraged, I just ask that you'd be obedient today. That might look like kneeling. That might look like asking for prayer for someone next to you. That might look like coming up front. God might be speaking to you today. I have a feeling God's speaking to some people in here today. If that's you, are you going to be obedient? The choice is yours. God doesn't twist your arm, but he'll invite you to come meet with him. Back to where we started. Is Jesus worthy? Is Jesus worthy? Jesus, you're worthy of all of our life. You're worthy of all of our life. You're worthy. You speak to us and we're thankful. You're worthy of a life laid down. You're worthy of a life even unto death, as you say. Are we living a life that brings worth? A crown that we could lay at his feet? That's our eternity. It's our eternity. We should be doing that. We should be having things to say, Jesus, I give you this too. Like the elders standing around the throne room as we speak today, they're saying, holy, 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 worthy is the lamb that was slain. So as we close today, God spoke to Moses. God spoke to Paul. God speaks to us. Are we listening? Are we obedient? Are we holding on to his promises? I encourage you to be obedient to what the, what the Lord's doing, what Holy Spirit's doing on your heart today. If it's uncomfortable, step out of that boat. Many people dog on Peter for falling. He didn't walk on water. But guess what? He's the only one that got out of the boat. He's also the only one that's walked on water other than Jesus. He didn't do it perfectly, but he's the only one. 
Are you willing to do that? It might look funny. It might look weird. It might be different than what your family's used to. I don't know. It's God asking you. That's what's important. Thank you. rather have Jesus than silver or gold. I'd rather be His than riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. I'd rather be And to be the king of a vast domain and be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world Rather have Jesus than bags of applause. I'd rather be faithful to His dear cause. I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. I'd rather be. Than to be the king of a vast domain and be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world. Are we on here? Yeah, she wanted to come up and share one thing that she feels like the Lord's been speaking to her recently. Um, so here we go. You know, I'm 94 years old, and I've been asking God, why am I here? Well, I found out that a week or so ago, I had sent a, a graduation gift to a young girl in this congregation. And I got a thank you note from her telling she told me that I was an amazing person and what I had done for her life. I got the answer from God in that thank you note. God. That's awesome. Praise God. Amen. It's a good day today. Now we have some other exciting, awesome things to happen today. Through the last several weeks, Mason and his family have been talking about getting baptized, and they decided today was the day, didn't you, Mason? Yeah? So I'm going to hand it over to uh, Daniel. He's going to take the confession. We're going to go back, and we're going to let this thing happen, bud. Excited? Yeah. <laughs> well, this is always a fun day as a dad. Um, you know, I think to start off, I have a little saying I use a lot. I think it's helped me a lot in life. Uh, the devil's in the details. It helps me spot deficiencies. It helps me be proficient at work and as a dad. Um, I think when I see things like this, what really sticks out to me uh, is God's in the details. It's easy for me to get caught up with work uh, and family, um, really any number of, of stress and chaos in life. Um, you know, I'm more focused on bills or money or whatever it is. Uh, but to him, his whole world is just getting baptized. His whole world is just following Jesus. Um, so, uh, you know... Having, having blessings on uh, these little children to me is, is fantastic, and I'm thankful for that. So, Mason, a couple questions for you, big man. Um, I know you have an amazing servant heart. Uh, you're loving, you're amazing, you're strong. Um, do you believe that Jesus 
uh, is the center of your whole world, and do you want to live, live for him? Yes. Fantastic. Um, i, I got to say I'm very proud of you, sir. Uh, you're awesome. You're fantastic. Uh, and I'm excited to, to go on this journey with you. Dean, what are you offering? While they uh, go back and get changed real fast, we'll let uh, Rick do offering real quick. Okay. Yeah, let the kids come up and share this excitement. Um, if, if there are those, any of you who, uh, who would like to know about uh, following Jesus or um, being baptized, any questions, please feel free to ask us. Um, ask a lot of people in the congregation would love to, to share with you uh, what that's meant in their life and, and study the scriptures with you and, and to do that. So um, be, be thinking of that now. Continuing on with, with our thought process um, at, at the time of our offering, um, it goes back to what we've been talking about this whole time about hearing from God, as Kyler shared, and where our heart is, as I shared in the um, communion meditation. And it even applies to giving. And I've heard this before, and I, I went searching for the scriptures yesterday because I wanted to make sure that I wasn't telling you something that was wrong. But I've, I've heard that if, if we don't have the right attitude, that maybe we shouldn't even give to God. You know? And so the scripture I want to point out is 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7. The point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one of us must give as he's decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, there's been times, of course, that all of us have given because we know that that's the right thing to do. And I'm not saying not to do that at all, because I do think that there's definitely value in obedience uh, of God. But we also need to concentrate on our heart. And where is our heart in the process? Not that we say, oh, we have to give, but rather that we get to give, because God doesn't want us to do it out of compulsion. He wants us to do it cheerfully because we love him and our heart is right for him. Now, let's celebrate this exciting event. things now. I want to pray, praise to God for that exciting moment. And also we'll pray for our offering and then they'll come forward and pass it. So dear Lord, thank you for this opportunity. Um, God, thank you for reminding us that, that you are calling for us and we need to listen. Lord, I thank you for Mason and his life. And I just pray a blessing, a special blessing on him from this point forward, uh, as you, as you develop in his life and as he encourages us, uh, help us to be an encouragement for him and help him to stay strong and faithful to you all the days of his life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Okay, is there uh, taking up the offering? Do we have any announcements today? I think Sheila has one. Do we have a mic that we could get to her? I know she doesn't want a mic, but... It's been several months. We've been putting together a card ministry. So um, if you are interested in that, if you'll just meet right up there where Rick's sitting, um, Debbie and I will, and Vicki will meet up there. We're going to figure out when we're going to meet and how we're going to do this. Okay, so if you're interested in being a part of the card ministry, as we know, uh, just even for hearing from Margaret how, how much it can change your life and things that just a card or a note to someone can mean, uh, we just uh, we, we think that's a great ministry, so we'd love to have people involved. So see Sheila afterwards for a quick meeting about that. Okay, Sue has one. I'm cooking Wednesday, so come and eat turkey okay. and noodles. Okay, Wednesday, uh, 11 to 1, turkey and noodles. I think we have another one maybe in the back. Okay, Kate, yes. I just wanted to say thank you real quick. We're not having an actual shower afterwards, but um, we really appreciate all the sweet gifts, and we're grateful to be a part of this community. So thank you. Well, we're excited for you. So. And if you didn't have an opportunity to get a gift for uh, Kate and Craig, I'm sure they would take it next week. So uh, feel free to bring those. We do have drumming on Tuesday at 3.30. Okay, anyone else? All right, we invite you to join us for this uh, last song. And the kids, come on, come on up. Got them on my knees again. Got them begging, please again. I need you. Oh, I need you. Walking down these desert roads. Wanna fall my thirsty soul. I need you. Oh, I need you. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Like the sound of the symphony to my ears It's like holy water on my skin Dead men walking, slave to sin I want to know about being born again I need you, oh I need you So take me to the riverside Take me under baptized, I need you, oh, I need you. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Like the sound of a symphony to my ears. It's like holy water on my skin. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. I don't want to abuse your grace. God, I need it every day. It's the only thing that ever really makes me want to change. Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Like the sound of a symphony to my ears. It's like holy water on my Your forgiveness is like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Like the sound of a symphony to my ears. It's like holy water on my skin. It's like holy water on my Oh.
Oh, yes, and next week, uh, Don will be speaking. Back here, drummer, Don. He'll be speaking uh, on Abraham and Sarah, so if you could read Genesis chapters 11 through 23. All right.